Hello and welcome in to another episode of Rolling with My Special Friends. Today we have an absolutely amazing lady that you need to be able to uh, hear her story and understand how God has touched her heart and taught her at a young age about the care of others and how she's taken in eight children into her home and the things that she's doing today to help those kids uh, live a great life. Uh, Miss Woods, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. Tell us, let's let's get right into this thing and so people understand. We, we just said eight kids. What in the world is it like to have eight kids in a house? <laughs> well, um, at the moment, there's actually only six that are at home. Um, I have two children that have um, since moved out. Uh, I have a daughter that is in college and our son is also moved out of the home. Um, he's living in California and working. Uh, so presently at home, I have six children, uh, but my number of children at home varies um, because we do foster care and we have adopted several children. And so sometimes I'll get some calls and I'll have, you know, children that will stay short term placements, long term placements. And so our house is just always it's different every single day. <laughs> That's uh, that's pretty special to have have a heart like that to want to take in others and make sure that they're okay and you know give them a better quality of life. Let you you mentioned to the fact about uh, uh, adopted kids and fosters and all that. Let's get into this uh, kid situation and let people know just how special this situation is. We got eight kids, two of them that are already older and moved out. So we got six at home, and three of the six are special needs kids. There's a lot of people out there that have a hard time even adopting a kid or fostering a kid. And then you go in above and beyond and bring in three special needs kids. What is it like to take care of three special needs kids every day? Um, so we have pretty much a routine that we <laughs> stick to. Like I said, that routine might change sometimes when we have a new child come in. Um, but uh, I have three of the children that are living at home right now are my biological children. And none of them have special needs. And so they are um, 15, 13, and 11. And so they have gotten to an age where they're very helpful and growing up with us adopting kids that have special needs, it just has become their heart also. And so they are very helpful. Um, we also have a routine. so. Um, we, one of our children attends, um, public school. And so she is in a special needs class. And so she goes to school. I have another child that has special needs that I homeschool during the day. And then I also have a baby at the moment that's with us during the day also. Wow. So you, it sounds like you've got it really kind of in a, in a routine or a pattern to be able to make this thing work each day, which is great because everybody's got to have something, a structure of some type to uh, get yeah. these things to uh, flow well. Now let's get into each kid individually. I want to tell their story. We're not going to, because of, uh, of, you know, worried about people uh, trying to figure out who people are. We're not going to say any names, but we want to talk about each one of these special kids. So I know one of them, uh, one of the special needs kids is 10 years old. Is that correct? Yes. So okay. my daughter, um, that's 10. Um, she was adopted internationally. Uh, we started the adoption process in 2016. She came home. She was almost four by the time she came home. Um, she had been adopted internationally. She was um, living in an orphanage. She had been there since birth. Um, she was born prematurely and she has uh, cerebral palsy and she has microcephaly. Um, so she is nonverbal and uses a wheelchair but she has um, great cognitive functions and she's full of joy and love. Uh, so she's able to not verbally communicate, but she will use, you know, um, signs and she'll point to certain things and she will communicate well, even though she's nonverbal. Okay. So now this same child, I think you and I had spoke the other day and I kind of want to really dive into this a little bit. What was the cause of this child to have uh, special needs? What, what happened in, in the birthing process? Um, so most children that have cerebral palsy uh, is from a lack of oxygen at birth. 
Um, and so this child was um, premature. And a lot of times, children that are premature, there's complications at birth because they're not necessarily ready to um, be birthed. And so she. Um, Okay. Now, now wasn't that, there, wasn't there? I'm some... sorry, that, that was my, <laughs> I'm so sorry. That is my nine-year-old daughter that I'm speaking about right now. I do oh. have another daughter that is also adopted from Ukraine. That's 10. Right. Yeah, no, and it's totally understandable. In the, in the nine-year-old that, that uh, we're discussing, yeah. we kind of got our ages mixed up, but the nine-year-old, yeah, we're, I'm we're, sorry. We're talking about her and, and tell everybody where she came from. What was the process? She is from Ukraine, my nine-year-old daughter, and she is the one that does have cerebral palsy. She was adopted at three years old. Uh, my daughter that is 10 years old, um, she was adopted from Ukraine at age of six. Um, she had been adopted by a family that had brought her to the U.S. Um, and unfortunately, after several months of having her, they did not feel um, that they could parent her any longer. And so we got a phone call asking us if we would be willing to take her. Um, so a month later, we got on a plane, flew to another state and picked her up. And she is about to be 11. So she's been with us for almost four years now. Um, and her special needs is um, she has fetal alcohol syndrome. Most children, unfortunately, that are adopted um, from these Eastern European countries suffer from this condition because women don't know the causes of them drinking alcohol during pregnancy. And it's just a casual thing there. And unfortunately, this causes a lot of disabilities, special needs, learning disabilities with these children um, after birth. And so it's not necessarily something that's recognized at birth, but as the child grows, then you definitely can tell that um, they have some needs, some that are more severe than other. So the level of alcohol that they drank, the more they drank during pregnancy, the more um, the child is affected. Now here in the US, you know, we hear all the time, don't drink when you're pregnant, you know, it can cause your child to have, you know, deformities, disabilities, um, but people there are just not educated on it. So now in this mother uh, that was drinking during this pregnancy, you're saying basically that is their way of dealing with things instead of probably having a, access to a bunch of medical drugs, they're, they're drinking during the pregnancy. Yes. Now, um, medical drugs and recreational drugs and any kind of drugs are very hard to access in these countries, um, unlike the U.S. And so most people, when they are suffering to drown their sorrows, they will actually drink. And some of them will just actually drink casually and not realizing that it's also harming their child. Wow. Now, tell me, you and I had talked as well on these two children, the nine and the 10 that came from the Ukraine. Isn't it kind of frowned upon over there to have a disability? I think we discussed at one time where there's two different areas that these children get to, sent to, like a boarding school and an institute. Yes, sir. So all these children, um, when they are born and sent to the orphanage, uh, they live in baby homes, baby houses. And then at the age of five or six, they're moved. And these children that don't have disabilities, most of them are moved to an orphanage called a boarding school because that's the age that a child would be starting school, kindergarten. And so they move them from the baby house at that age and they start school. These children that have disabilities, they don't actually have access to any education. So they will be sent at the age of five or six to a place called an institution. And in these institutions, the children are not schooled. So now in the, to, to break the two down for people that are trying to understand and follow the process, a boarding school is where regular children are going to learn and grow up, but an institution is where actually a child with a disability is sent. Yes, sir. And now the, in the institution, is there a way for that child to work themselves out of there or are they there the rest of their life? Um, no, they're there for the rest of their lives. 
Um, unfortunately, um, it's just a lack of education. A lot of these um, people have a mentality that uh, kids with special needs can't learn. And so they just don't want to take the time to teach them something that they really feel they just can't learn. It's like a waste of their time, a waste of their resources. That's just unbelievable. So they're basically going to stay in this institute until they just die, you know, naturally. Yes. Wow. I, I just don't even know where to begin with that. Yes. And unfortunately, after transfer, many times these children will die quickly. That That's a... Uh... That's something very special for everybody out there that's listening for Miss Woods to go out and her husband to go into the Ukraine and bring back two children, but not only bring back two children, bring back two special needs children to the U.S. to give them a better quality of life. That's just, I don't even know how to put it into words, how amazing you guys are with the heart that you have to do this for these kids. Is Did I not also understand in the process when you told me about going there and trying to get some kids for adoption, they were trying to talk you out of bringing the special needs kids back? Yes. So when you go to Ukraine, um, you have to go there with a blind referral. And basically that means is you're not allowed to pre-select a child before getting there. Uh, once you get there, then they'll show you the available children. And when we selected our daughter, once we were in Ukraine and we went to go meet her in the orphanage, um, the orphanage that she was in, most of the children were typical children. So there was maybe a select few out of the 250 children that were there that had special needs. And so the um, nannies and the staff there just couldn't understand why we would go there, travel, come and get a child. And we were selecting a child that had special needs. They just couldn't understand that. They were telling us, why don't you take this child or this child or this child? And of course, they're all worthy of the same. Um, but it, it was difficult because, of course, we just wanted to bring them all back. <laughs> but we can't. But we knew that God had called us um, to her specifically. Uh, he made it very clear and that is who we were supposed to bring home. Wow. Now that's just Again, that is a, a special place uh, for somebody to be, to be able to think in their heart to bring back two kids like that to the United States and give them a better life. That is just, I mean, it's amazing to hear that story and how all that played out. Now, to take us in, in our audience into this third kid, into the foster baby, tell, tell me the story and, and get us into that because I know people are going to love to hear this as well of how, how you saved this young child's life. Um I know it was uh, nine, nine months in the ICU. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so after we came back from Ukraine and uh, the first time, and then we adopted our second daughter, God really started um, working on our hearts that, um, you know, there was a need here also in the U.S. Um, for children that have special needs. And so we had thought about being foster parents for a long time. We had started classes two or three times before, um, but we had just decided during COVID, you know, we have all this time. So let's dedicate this time and take these classes. Well, when we started taking classes, we saw that there was a huge need for parents that are considered therapeutic foster parents. So therapeutic foster parents are different from regular foster parents. They take medical and behavioral children. And those children are considered hard to place um, because children that are typical are easier to place than children that have special needs and children that have um, you know, emotional needs. And so we did our classes. Um, we've been foster parents now for over a year, almost a year and a half that we've been done our process. Um, we've had three children come through our home since then. And the last one that's in our home now, she's been with us um, for several months now, 10 months almost. She uh, had um, been born prematurely also and she um, suffered again a traumatic birth, caused her to have um, some developmental delays, and she also has cerebral palsy. 
Um, so we are not sure to the extent of, you know, what her life will look like, but she's a joy to have in our home. She still has medical needs. So she's on oxygen and feeding tubes and several different things, lots of therapies, but um, she's doing wonderfully. And every day we just see a little miracle in progress. That's just, uh, it's just special listening to the, this, this whole story and, and take, take us a little bit deeper into this story. I think you and I, like I said, had talked that she was in the NICU nine months and it was, it was because of a reason or something happened there that caused some of the problems too. maybe a inserting of a tube wrong. Yes. Yeah, so she, um, you know, was, uh, born prematurely, um, drug, drug addicted also. Um, a lot of these babies that are born here in the U S that are taken at birth is because of drug addiction. And so she had been, um, born during right, right before COVID started. And so unfortunately with these children, you know, um, during this COVID time, they restricted all visitation from most people unless you were a parent. So even grandparents, aunts, uncles couldn't see these children in the NICU. And so she was there, you know, alone this whole time. Um, she did have the nurses there and they're wonderful people, but, you know, they just can't sit in her room all the time with her loving on her, you know, they have other patients and things to take care of. And especially with this COVID crisis emergency, all of these nurses are tired, they're overworked, they're scared, you know, of these viruses of losing their own life. They, um, so it was just a difficult time. And there was a lot of, um, there was no parent there for her to make this medical decisions for her. And there was a lot of complications that caused her also to have more disabilities to the fact and be there longer had she had a parent there, um, she would have probably been released from the hospital a lot earlier. Well, that's uh, so basically then since she didn't have a parent there, the hospital was kind of doing the best care that they could at the time to try to keep her alive. And then, and like I said, we, we talked earlier uh, about the this tube. Could you tell me about the I know you said something to the fact of the tube was supposed to be inserted in a certain area and didn't. No, yes. So she had an NG tube, which is a feeding tube that goes down through um, your nose into your stomach. And so she couldn't take any food orally. And so that's how they were giving her her feeds. And unfortunately, one day when her tube was replaced and moved, instead of the tube going down into her stomach, like it's supposed to, it actually went down into her lungs. And so when they gave her this feed, unfortunately, it like basically filled her lungs with this formula. And so it's almost drowned her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's a story I knew people needed to hear because I, that, that's just yeah. that I don't know. That's just kind of a mistake you can't make. You can't put that formula n not where it, it's not supposed to go. Right. Exactly. And, um, you know. I don't blame the medical system. I'm thankful for the medical system that we have here in the US. I'm thankful for the doctors and nurses. Um, I feel for them because especially right now, they're still overworked because of this virus. And it's just- So, and now this- suffering. This little baby that we're talking about right now, the, the one and a half year old foster baby is also on oxygen every day, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So now, now to get everybody a great look into what's going on, we've talked about the three special needs kids, and we've talked a little bit about the, the other three that are in the home that are helping out. How about the two older ones that just left? I know you, you and I spoke, and you have a daughter that's really has been in the family and been touched by what all's going on, and she's actually in school to be a social worker. Is that correct? Yes. So she is in her second year of college. Um, um for social work. She's also in California and she's doing beautifully there. Uh, she's not sure exactly what she wants to do once she graduates, but definitely wants to work with children. And um, we're so glad that, you know, she's inspired by it and she's chosen it as her career path 
because many times people will say, oh my goodness, when you take in these special needs kids, when you take in these foster children, you know, what about your biological kids? Are they getting, you know, the attention that they need? And are you ruining them or, you know? <laughs> and so it's a question, it's a genuine question. And when we first took our first daughter in, you know, we weren't sure how our kids were gonna handle that. Um, but honestly, they're better human beings for it. They are kinder, they have compassion for people. And when they talk about when they're gonna be older, they say, oh, I'm going to adopt kids too, mommy. And, you know, I want to work with kids that have special needs. And our other daughter wants to be a nurse and one wants to be a physical therapist. And so even though we don't have it all together, I know that we're doing what we're supposed to because I see it in my children. That is just uh, another special part of this story that I think everybody needed to hear is that you're changing not only some special needs kids' lives and giving them opportunities, but you're taking regular everyday normal kids and exposing them to children with special needs and it's changing their life and making them more compassionate have a bigger heart toward others and I just know when they get out in the public how amazing those children are going to be to be around because they're going to be so compassionate for other people right and um, also they it's exposing their friends and their groups and their peers to these children also and that's just been beautiful to watch because we have seen their friends, you know, at first they had fears of coming around our children almost because they had never been exposed to it. And now just seeing them break down and just include them has just been so special. Oh yeah. Now, and talking about being exposed to other kids and being out in the public and stuff, tell everybody listening a little bit about the school system. I know you have a child with special needs in a public school system. How are the schools receptive uh, to the child or have you had some systems that you've gone through that weren't receptive and maybe you had to move somewhere else? Yeah, so when we first moved to Alabama two years ago, we didn't know much about Alabama. And so we just settled in a certain area and we went and visited the schools and we just felt like our daughter's needs were not going to be able to be met there. And so I chose to homeschool our children that had special needs at the time. And we looked around at different districts and we found a lovely town that we live in now. Um, and we moved here just so that our daughter could attend. Um, and they, she has a very small class size. It's almost one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, they take the children every week to equestrian therapy. They have a garden, they have chickens. I mean, it's just a beautiful experience. And I'm so thankful that God brought us here from Florida so that my daughter could attend the school because in Florida, we absolutely loved her um, school and her needs were being met there, but it was difficult to make the transition. And it was at first it was like, Lord, why did you bring us here? But we knew that his plans were good and that he was going to give us, you know, something good out of it. And we just couldn't ask for better for her. So definitely go and visit the schools. If you have children with special needs, you know, make your voice known. You have to advocate for them wherever you go. So now, and when you talked about that school system and also being able to advocate for them, are there some things out there, other resources as well uh, for parents that may have children with special needs? How would you recommend them going to look for extracurricular activities, things to be able to do just how you and I had met from another organization you got involved with? How, how do people get out there and look for things to get these kids involved in? Right. So I'm thankful that we have access to internet now um, because everything is online now. And um, when, you know, we first brought our daughter home, the first one that came home that had cerebral palsy, it was kind of difficult for me because I had worked in the healthcare field before. So I, I have a degree in physical therapy and I also have certifications with um palliative care, which is hospice care. And so I had been exposed to people that had, you know, disabilities and things, um, but I wasn't personally educated on what the community offered 
and the counties offered and the states offered for these children. And so when she first came home, I was like, Lord, I don't want to fail her. I want her to be able to have all the opportunities that she can have. And so it's very important to if you need anything, just research it online, find local support groups, um, because these people understand where you come from, what you're doing. Um, a lot of these people, you know, have been here for years, so they can tell you if you need a certain thing, go see this person and that. Uh, there's a lot of resource information fairs um, also that, you know, you can go to and they give you all the resources um, for your children because, they should be allowed the same opportunities as any other child. And so they have a right to the same kind of education. They have the right to the same kind of extracurricular activities and anything you know that needs to be adjusted for them to be able to do it. Just you have to be your child's advocate. I do not accept no <laughs> when someone tells me no. I'm like, okay, well, Tell me maybe instead, and then let's try to find the answer to this and how we can make this happen. Yeah, I think that's great advice from listening to uh, everything you said, that a parent does need to step up for their child because, you know, if, if you don't step up or we don't step up, nobody else will. And that child needs, just like you stepped up and went to the Ukraine and got these kids, Every kid needs an opportunity. They just sometimes need somebody to step up for them in their corner. Now to get over into you a little bit so that people know a little bit about your background. If I'm uh, understanding correctly, you went to college and was a physical therapist. Is that correct? Yes. So I went to college. I took a degree in physical therapy. Um, I also took a certificate um, working for palliative care, which is hospice care. So people at the end of life. Um, and I was actually working with geriatric population. Um, but growing up, my mother was a social worker for um, Children's Protective Services. And so since a young age, I've been around kind of this, you know, foster care system type thing because my mother did it for several years. And so that, you know, exposed me to it. And so I knew that I wanted to do something medical. Um, and so, that's why I chose that career path. Um, little did I know that I would actually be doing my career at home <laughs> with my children versus, you know, out, out there in hospitals or, you know, clinics or people's homes. But um, I'm grateful that I have that background and I think it's been able to help me. Well, and I think it's a pretty special thing, too, for people to hear your story as you and I talked the other day of how at a young age you were just led in your heart to know that this was going to be your role in life. I think you told me as early as eight or nine years old. Yes. So everyone, you know, when you're a child, a question that adults always ask you is, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, I think something that most people ask and everybody just has these grand, you know, plans. Most of the time they'll tell you they'll be, you know, want to be an astronaut or some sort of firefighter or you know and so which is wonderful but when I was young people would ask me what do you want to do when you grow up and I just had this burden in my heart for children and I said well I want to have an orphanage when I grow up and so people were kind of always taken back by that when I would say it but it was just a desire of mine that God had put in my heart to just care for the fatherless, you know, the children that did not have parents. I didn't know how that was going to look like. Um, and so I'm thankful that I feel like I'm doing and ministering and doing what God intended me to do. And that's a very special calling in itself that I don't know that there's a lot of people out there that have been given the opportunity that you are to take care of these kids. Cause you know, I've always heard it said that God won't put more on you than you can handle. And he definitely must feel like you can handle a lot. <laughs> and I think that he does put more on you than you can handle. But I think if you lean on him, he just carries you through, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, I don't know how you do it. And I could never do that. But you can, you can do it. Anyone can do it. If you choose to do it, you can do it. 
Yeah, and I, I think you uh, and I had talked too, and you said something about everyone can do something. And I think this is your something in life that you've been called to do is you can really take care of these kids and give them a hope and a future that they never had. And, you know, to change over and give us a little bit of the, the lighter side, you know, everything's always serious and you always got so many things going on in life and everything's busy, but to give the audience out there listening, tell us something that's uh, funny that's happened in your life. <laughs> well, we have a lot of memorable moments. Um, you know, I'm sure that you, you can understand that. Honestly, our life is just, um, you know, people think that we have it all together every day, but behind the scenes, you know, we're a hot mess every day. I mean, you know, I have two children on feeding tubes. Um, and so sometimes those feeding tubes are just exploding all, all the place. You know, we have you know, bodily fluids all over the place all the time. It's just, it's just, um, you know, by the grace of God, we're still here and we're still doing it, but it's just, we're, we call ourselves the hot mess express. And so we do this and it's not always gracefully, but we just get it done. And we're so thankful. And we are just, we're thankful. We're thankful that we get to do this. We live in a world where we get to show compassion to other people. Well, that, I mean, I don't know for everybody out there listening. I, I've, I've listened to this whole story uh, during the podcast and even talking to you with before. And I, I just almost can't make it through even listening to you talk without shedding a few tears because it just touches my heart right. that somebody would go to the level that you're going to, to deal with these kids that have have special needs. Just as you said, it's not pretty. I mean, you got things out there, bodily fluids and other things there. And, and, you know, to some people that would gross them out. But to me, I think that it just makes this story even more special that it is that you would go above and beyond for these children. And I, I don't know how, you know, our podcast is all about introducing the world to uh, special people. Cause I call it rolling with my special friends. And if, you don't qualify for being special. I don't know who does with all the things that you do and, and what you overcome every day. So, right. so to wrap this thing up and kind of give people a good look into you, um, tell us if things were to going to be over tomorrow and something happened to you, what, and, and we wrote a book about the, the story of your life. What would you hope people read in that book? Well, first of all, I couldn't do this without my husband. <laughs> so I do have to give him credit. Um, he's a wonderful man, and um, we just, um, you know, both share the same heart. He didn't always have this heart, but just as we grew together, um, we just both started having this same heart. And so I, you know, definitely would um, want to talk about him and how special he is, um, because I think it's easier for women to be caregivers, but when men really step up and, you know, I mean, he's kind of the person that he would just let me do what I want, but he actually loves this also. <laughs> and so I'm just thankful for him. And honestly, I just, I just want people to remember that we are regular people. There is nothing special about us. We are broken, just like everybody else that we live in a broken world. And this is how it is, but we have to look and most of us choose to turn a blind eye to this and it's all around us. And so if we just open our eyes and open our hearts, you know, God will give us the strength and God will carry us through. It's just, <clears throat> it doesn't take a special person. That's all I want to say is there's nothing special about me. I'm broken and I fail daily. I'm going to tell you, you know, sometimes, <laughs> like I said, we don't always do it so gracefully. Um, but, you know, we're so thankful, you know, and, and it reminds my children to be thankful through it all also, because they see the struggle that a lot of these children have every day that my children don't have to struggle with. And so they are just more compassionate and caring individuals because of it. And like you said earlier, everybody can do something. And not everybody is called to foster or adopt. And not everybody is called to foster or adopt special needs children either. But if we all would just come together, this world would just be a better place. I, I don't know how uh, our audience can't listen to that and not be inspired by it. You know, we can... 
all sit around and, and talk about our problems and the things we got going on and the things we wish we could do. But like you said, to put your heart out there and just be a regular everyday person that, that gives and wants to help others, that I think that's what separates you from the group and makes you special because there's not everybody out there with a heart like you have and not everybody out there trying to, you know, help others. So I, I for one, just want to say thank you for what you do for these kids and how you're changing their lives. And, and also thank you for coming on our show today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me and letting me, you know, voice this. And I think it's important for people to know. And like I said, it doesn't take a special person. There's several children in foster care here, even in the U S and in our state that need homes and there's no homes to place them. I get several calls you know, a day. And um, unfortunately, I just can't take them all. I wish I could, but I just can't. And so if we all do our part, you know, it will just be a better place. And there's resources. If you want to look up how to be a foster parent, there's resources online that will teach you. There's several agencies that can license you. There's several, just in Ukraine alone, there's 150,000 orphans right now waiting for home. Wow. So 150,000 kids looking for a place to go. It, yeah. So for homes in the Ukraine and here in the United States, there's almost half a million children in foster care. My goodness. Well, again, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show today. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And hopefully uh, in a few months or so, we can circle back around and, and have another conversation and see how the life is going with these kids and how they're these special needs kids are out in the public changing other people's lives for everybody out there listening make sure you tune in uh to our next episode also go over to our facebook page our uh website rollingmyspecialfriends.com and check out the old episodes and uh catch up on everything you've missed with some of these great people out there like miss woods thank you again very much for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you soon thank you 